My name's Cliff Lampy, and I'm here to convince you over the next 13 minutes that social media is good for you. Now, the natural question you want to ask yourself right now is why did they get an old gray-haired Sasquatch up here to tell people that social, especially a group of young people, that social media is good for them? And one of the first things I want to convince you of is that there's actually a science of social media. So all of my adult academic life, I've been studying social media. We used to not call it that, but it was still online interaction. And now the world has moved with me. So there is hundreds, if not thousands, of scholars across the world who are studying the effects of social media, not just on people, but on society as a whole. Facebook itself is hiring hundreds of PhDs out of top universities to study the social effects of social media. And all social media companies and all universities across the world are really taking this on as an endeavor. Is social media good for us, however, is that at the root of so many of those questions? And in spite of or because of some of this, there's a very common narrative that social media is actually very bad for us, right? Uh, so Prince Ia really gave a nice, uh, I think, introduction to this, sorry. Uh, where he talks, have, have, you've all seen this video, where the, the title of the video is Can We Autocorrect Humanity? Where he gives a really nice spoken word introduction to the idea that technology is driving us further apart. That what, instead of enhancing intimate relationships, what technology does is drive us away from intimate relationships. And I love this Atlantic uh, Monthly article or cover for that exact same idea, right? So the idea that even when we're physically present with one another, that we're somehow separated, that you're looking at the phone. I'm sure we've all been annoyed by somebody when we're talking to them who can't but help look down at their phone, right? It happens. Sherry Turkle at MIT has called this alone together. That when sometimes when we're in social groups and when we're with one another, that we can ruin that experience by coming into, into the mediated environment, that a text will pop up. And these devices are cleverly designed. A small buzz. How many of you just salivate when you feel that little buzz of your iPhone uh, across the table, right? Ooh, I might have another trivia crack opportunity here. The other thing that people worry about is that what we're replacing these close, intimate relationships with are unreal relationships, right? This replacement theory says that it's not just that these are bad relationships, they're just, they don't, they don't, they're not authentic. They don't help us at all. And when I see these fake friends, I think, wow, they're having a much better life than I am. If I'm scrolling through Twitter or Facebook and I see these very cra uh, carefully crafted identities that they're making, I might think to myself, you know, my kids aren't as good looking as their kids. You know, my students, just are not as smart as their students. They go on much better vacations than I do. They eat better. Well, that's probably true. But, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it creates basically a sadness in us that these things are happening. And sometimes I want to say that the social media experience really is quite awful, right? So there's this idea is, is it actually bad or is it just our perception that it's bad? So, you know, is this anxiety real, basically? Uh, you'll be maybe happy to know that this anxiety has existed for as long as we've had technologies. In the early 20th century, somebody said that jazz would replace thinking with just baseless inspiration from pundits and jazz. Um, <laughs> The telephone was criticized because it would lead to a rude, incivil society because people could just interrupt you over your phone at dinner. Uh, famously, uh, Plato said in Phaedrus, uh, he quoted Socrates as saying that the invention of writing itself, one of our first forms of information technology, would lead to the degradation of humanity because it was a dead way of communicating. It couldn't respond. And sometimes these things really are bad. You know, if you look at things like cyberbullying uh, and you look at what's going on with Gamergate, these things really did cause us to have huge negative reactions. Uh, people have been really hurt, have had trauma, have in some cases killed themselves because of the bullying incidences that they face through these social media channels. And the especially harassment of women and uh, uh, people who are disadvantaged in these channels is something we need to solve as a society. But. I do think that there are instances when, and growing scientific evidence that social media really can be good for you. So for the past 10 years, my colleague Nicole Ellison and I, also at the School of Information, have been studying the relationship between social network sites and a concept called social capital. Most of you have probably heard that term. It's basically the, the idea of resources or things you can get from your social connections. Basically, what can being in a social network provide you as in another type of resource? So having social capital means, for instance, in a neighborhood means that your neighbors might help you dig out of the snow, which was very useful for us in Michigan this year. Uh, but it can also mean that they provide you emotional support, or it can mean that they give you physical resources like money or help moving. Or, but sometimes it's just that they provide you with a new worldview, new insights into what it's like to be a person not like you. 
The idea behind the relationship between social media and social capital is that communication of all forms helps us to build relationships. Right? We actually know from a long history in sociology that to build a relationship and to build energy into a friendship means investing time and actual effort into that relationship. Now, where social media plays a role in all this is we tend to think about the effects of these technologies only on our very close relationships. Right? We have lots of ways of talking to our close relationships. When I talk to my best friend or I speak with my spouse, you know, hopefully we're not just communicating over Facebook. Hopefully we, we do communicate over Facebook, but hopefully we also meet face to face and the variety of other ways that we have. What social media makes different is this group of weak ties. Weak ties are colleagues or casual acquaintances, people who are not like us. And these casual acquaintances provide us with a lot of benefits. The people around you are a lot like you. That's the effect of homophily. You surround yourself pretty much with people who are like you, and that's okay. But what weak ties provide you is different information. Maybe it's a conservative viewpoint, or maybe it's somebody who's lived in a different city. These weak ties can provide you with novel information and resources and be hugely powerful for uh, the types of benefits that you get out of these sites. Even really ephemeral relationships can be incredibly powerful. So here's a great example from just a couple of months ago here on University of Michigan's campus, right? Yik Yak, which if you don't know it, uh, is geolocation-based and incredibly anonymous and incredibly ephemeral. Here's a person who uh, states a fairly specific, what would be worrisome to me, suicide plan in Yik Yak. And people responded in really great ways to this person. I don't know what happened to this person. It is an anonymous platform. But what the community did surrounding that, even in a context of anonymity, which we usually think of as worst case scenario, really does speak to the power of these tools to allow people to interact. In this case, Yik Yak's anonymity probably allowed this person to state a feeling they could not have said to their close friends, right? Or they were trying out maybe a really negative emotion or something they were struggling with in an anonymous community, and that played a role. We also have seen the power of social media to facilitate organizing. Now, not even the most rabid social media guy is going to say that social media caused the Arab Spring. But we do know from both uh, Arab Spring, we do know from other social movements, that social media basically makes it easier to communicate and to collaborate. Right? It reduces the cost of doing business if what you want to do is to collect a whole bunch of other people. It raises the voice of people who previously were powerless. It helps people who previously did not have control of the media to be their own media. And that is powerful across a variety of social media platforms. We have seen the ability of things like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube to be a change agent in all matter of social movements over the past three years. And it's not just the Arab Spring, but it's also Occupy, it's also Ferguson, it's also here with being black at the University of Michigan and what that enabled our students to do for their own uh, power and capacity here. So how does social media foster these things? What is it about social media that's important? One thing is this idea that don't think of social media as a tool, right? Especially it's not, social media is not one thing. Even a site like Facebook is not one thing. Facebook is three dozen applications that have been all tied together as a variety of ways to communicate. And I'm sure you've all seen this. Your Aunt Mary may only send you Farmville invitations, right? You may have another friend, you probably only use Facebook to communicate through direct messages or to check on things. Each of these applications have a variety of tools that, what, that afford, as we would say, different types of interactions. Just as a normal fork, not our cool uh, chain fork here, affords the action of picking up food, Tools like sharing a photo or tagging or voting all afford certain types of social processes that we really need to think about and consider. So I, like you, I'm sure I'm a huge fan of Taylor Swift, right? Um, they have asked me to stop sending fan mail, but that's okay. Um, and when you look at things like her retweets, she posts a picture of her cat, and you see she gets thousands of retweets and shares and favorites and everything like this. That is a signal of a community forming around this particular artist. This is a way for people to basically take control and to curate their own presence. And when you have 54 million followers, you can really uh, shake it off, as it were. <laughs> so some of the things that these tools allow you, the visibility of these applications, the, the fact that I can send out a post on Twitter and X number of people are going to see it, especially if it gets retweeted, it just enhances the virality, the opportunity for people to see content. Persistence, the fact that it's available, the fact that once you send it out there, it's powerfully available for people in a week or in a day or whenever. 
the editability, the fact that you can curate content, the fact that you can create a presence online for either yourself or for your organization. One of the important aspects that that all leads to is this idea of social grooming. One of the consistent findings that we have is that one of the important parts of social media is this social grooming effect. So in primate, social grooming is like I'm picking fleas off of you and eating them. Uh, in humans, it's much more like, hey, I'm gonna spend some of my very precious attention on you. And that very little bit of attention that I have is gonna be dependent on how much of a relationship we have. So my spouse demands a decent amount of my attention. My kid, also. Uh, however, a distant friend on Facebook, not so much. So you see great instances of social grooming on Facebook uh, with things like the Facebook uh, birthday message. Now, is getting a Facebook birthday message as good as getting a cake? And I love me some cake. <laughs> it's not. But I'm going to tell you what, it's either for most of my Facebook list, it's either that birthday message or nothing. I'm not going to send them a cake, right? And I don't think I would want 500 cakes to arrive at my door for birthdays. There are certain types of relationships, those weak ties, where these very lightweight social grooming things, the likes, the votes, the shares, the comments, things that we often consider banal are hugely powerful. What do we need to do to increase our chances to benefit from social media? I think there's a couple of things. So how, I, th I think social media can be good, but it takes work, right? It's not just that we're on social media. There are two main things I think we need to do. One is we need to become more literate in social media. We just assume, especially for a younger generation, that they're born knowing how to use the Twitter and the Facebook, and we throw up our hands and we call it good. How many of you had social media banned in your high schools, right? That's where we should be teaching social media, not waiting for you to figure it out and to get into trouble. We also need to be really thinking about the design of these things. This is Elo, which really has expanded our opportunity to, to see new forms of social network sites and is a, a reaction to Facebook. How we use social media and how we decide to use social media is the key secret sauce here, right? Social media is a blank canvas and it's us who's painting. If you don't like what's on social media, I challenge you to change what you put on social media because you're the ones who are filling in that content. Thank you very much.